presentation of the South Carolina Educational Television Network. Major funding for the Voices and Visions series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Annenberg Media. Additional series funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. Special funding is provided by the Witterbinner Foundation for Poetry. Under white clouds, cielo di Pisa, out of all this beauty, something must come. Nove maggio, quattordicesimo anno dell'era fascista. In the final days of World War II, the American poet Ezra Pound was taken into custody near Genoa by the United States Armed Forces. He was charged with treason for making wartime broadcasts from fascist Italy. He'd begun doing some broadcasts before the war, and I think they were on literary subjects. It was entirely his own idea. The Italians did not ask him to do anything. He wasn't, by the way, ever bothering or thinking of broadcasting to the troops. In fact, he wasn't even on the radio band that went to the troops in Italy. He was talking to the people whom he thought might throw Roosevelt uh, out of the White House. I think he was a damn fool. I think he was a, um, a literary peacock. Um, he was not a fascist, because a fascist is someone who was close to Mussolini, who believed in what Mussolini was doing. No, let me say, who knew what Mussolini was doing and who had some share in political power. Pound was isolated in an iron cage at the American Disciplinary Training Center at Pisa and then moved to a tent and given access to a typewriter. In his five months confinement at the camp, Pound wrote the Pisan Cantos, 11 sections of an epic poem of the 20th century. As a lone ant from a broken anthill, from the wreckage of Europe, ego scriptor. The rain has fallen, the wind coming down out of the mountain, a look a forti de marmi. In one of the radio speeches, for instance, he said, uh, someone was saying, you know, why have you abandoned poetry for uh, um, uh, economics? And he says, I haven't abandoned poetry. So. He, he continued to write cantos all the time in the back of his mind. I don't think he ever stopped writing cantos. I think that he has written cantos ever since that first ode to the West that he sent to his mother when he was 20. I was born in Haley, Idaho, near the Sawtooth Range. 5,000 feet above sea level and 5 million miles from anywhere, let alone civilization. I resolved that at 30 I would know more about poetry than any man living. In this search I learned more or less of nine foreign languages. I read oriental stuff in translation. I fought every university regulation and every professor who bothered me with requirements for degrees. <laughs> I think Pound showed absolute good sense in going to Europe. He had to go to Europe because he was obsessed with Europe. I try to imagine Pound in New York. I try to imagine Pound in Chicago. It's absurd. Pound left America in 1908, settling first for three months in Venice. He began to absorb the language of Dante and Cavalcante and the Romanesque architecture of Northern Italy. But his great affinity was with the literature of southern France and the spirit of the troubadours.
Practically all the poetry of the modern world arose from 12th century Provence. The Provençal triumph is an art between literature and music. A man may walk the hill roads and river roads from Limoges to Dordogne and learn a little of what the country meant to the wandering singers. He may learn why so many canzos open with speech of the weather and why such a man made war on such and such castles. Nicam bei sobre els prats, tendes i pavillus fermats, i a iranta l'elle grazie, que em bei per xampany o ringats, xavaries i xavars armats. Pound wrote poems in the Provençal form, copying their intricate rhyme schemes. The troubadours helped to provide him with personae, masks, a device he learned from Browning. In one poem, Alta Forte, he took the persona of a warlike knight. There are six stanzas, each with six lines, and the six line endings repeated in each stanza. Alta forte, locutor in Bertrand's de Born. Dante Alighieri put this man in hell because he was a stirrer up of strife. Judge ye, have I dug him up again? The scene is in his castle, Altaforte. Papiol is his jongler, the leopard, the arms of Richard Coeur de Leon. Damn it all, all this our salt stinks, peace. You horse and dog, Papiol, come, let's the music. I have no life save when the swords clash. But ah, when I see the standards gold of air purple opposing, and the broad fields beneath them turn crimson, then how I my heart nigh mad with rejoicing. In summer have I great rejoicing when the tempests kill the earth's foul peace, and the lightnings from black heaven flash crimson and the fierce thunders are me their music, and the winds shriek through the clouds mad opposing, and through all the riven skies, God's odds clash. He says when he came to England, he was 40 years out of date. And that is, I think, uh, almost an understatement. I think he was at least half a century out of date when he arrived in England. It took a long time to catch up. Several years before he'd even got up to the 90s poets. He did uh, believe before he reached England that Yeats was the only great poet living and went after him. If you'll read Yeats and Browning and Swinburne and Rossetti, you'll learn something about the progress of English poetry in the last century. Oh, of course, Rossetti was, in a sense, his father and his mother. Uh, it was Rossetti that had first wakened him up to the possibilities of poetry. Pound's teens must have been dominated by the sound of Rossetti. And uh, the feeling of Rossetti. Pound's romantic tastes were shared by Dorothy Shakespeare, a young English painter he met while giving a series of lectures at Regent Street Polytechnic. Dorothy was to become his wife and collaborator, sharing his energies for the new directions of the modernist movement. A great deal of modernism um, seems to have gotten underway simultaneously about 1909 or 10. Virginia Woolf said that sometime in December 1910, human nature changed. I don't think it is as, quite as mysterious as it looks. There was a lot of convergent technology suddenly coming to issue at about that time. The most evident thing that was going on was the electrification of the transport systems of all the big cities of the world almost at once. Once in Paris, I got out of the metro station and saw suddenly one beautiful face. 
then another. And then another. And I tried all day to find words for what that meant to me, and I could not find any words. And that evening there came an equation, not in speech, but in little splotches of color. I realized that if I were a painter, I could found a new school of painting, painting in splotches of color. I wrote a 30-line poem and destroyed it. Six months later, I made a poem half that size. A year later, I made this haiku-like sentence. image is the poet's pigment. The image is not an idea. It is a radiant node or cluster, a vortex through which and from which and into which ideas are constantly rushing. It is as true for painting and sculpture as it is for poetry. Pound borrowed ideas from the other arts. The most dynamic, the most daring innovations were being done in sculpture. I have written more than once that Gaudier Brezhka was the most complete case of genius I have ever encountered. Here was the veritable spirit of awakening. The best conversation before World War I was to be found under a railway arch by Putney. And some of my best days, the happiest and the most interesting, were spent in his uncomfortable mud-floored studio. Sculptural energy is the mountain. Sculptural feeling is the appreciation of masses in relation. Sculptural ability is the defining of these masses by planes. In one of his poems, The Return, Pound tried to emulate the objective qualities of a Gaudier sculpture. It looks like a dismembered fragment of Sappho, the way fragments of Sappho look on the page when they're being reproduced from torn parchments and the left-hand side has been ripped away. That was a way of using the classical heritage that nobody had ever thought of before. Pre-war Europe was guttering down to its end. The upper strata of society was rotten, trivial, idiotic. In any case, the years immediately before the great slaughter were full of exhilaration for those in the middle of the action. All our work was the work of outlaws. Hound became a leader of the avant-garde, together with Wyndham Lewis and T.E. Hume. It was time for manifestos. Years 1837 to 1900. Curse, abysmal, 
inexcusable middle class. Also, aristocracy and proletariat. The artist has at last been aroused that the war between him and the world is a war without truce. Those artists whose work does not show this strife are uninteresting. They work in an unchanging world. In the winter of 1914, Ezra and Dorothy Pound, newly married, were in Stone Cottage in Sussex with William Butler Yeats. Pound had been working on a series of Chinese translations which he called Café. He sent them to Gojie Breshka, who had gone to the front. And once again, later, we met at the South Bridgehead. And then the crowd broke up. You went north to San Palace. And if you ask how I regret that parting, it is like the flowers falling spring's end, confused, whirled in a tangle. What is the use of talking? And there is no end of talking. There is no end of things in the heart. I call in the boy, have him sit on his knees here to seal this and send it a thousand miles, thinking. You find in his work repeated references to the crime of war, to the fact that war was not necessary if people would only understand economic theory and how the politicians uh, were manipulated by the banks. This war is possibly a conflict between two forces almost equally detestable. Atavism and the loathsome spirit of mediocrity cloaked in graft. My problem is to keep alive a certain group of advancing poets, to set the arts in their rightful place as the acknowledged guide and lamp of civilization. His real concern, the concern that made him famous and made him a decisive, unique influence, was this enormous interest in and generosity about other poets and writers. Among the writers Pound tirelessly promoted were James Joyce and Ford Maddox Ford. But his greatest literary discovery was a fellow American, T.S. Eliot. Eliot is the only American I know of who has made what I can call adequate preparation for writing. He has actually trained himself and modernized himself on his own. The rest of the promising young have done one or the other, but never both. Most of the swine have done neither. Pound's London career continued to be controversial. By 1917, he was contributing art reviews and then music reviews to the New Age. Everyone in London has heard of Mr. Dolmetsch and his instruments. As Lewis and Picasso are capable of revitalizing design, so a return to pattern music played on ancient instruments is able to make music again a part of life. Poetry is a composition of words set to music. Poets who are not interested in music are bad poets. He didn't, I think, get that idea straight out of nowhere. I think he got it uh, from Walt Whitman. But in Homage to Sextus Propertius, Ezra discovered how to organize a poem on the model of music so that every line grows out of the line before by modification of the rhythm. The effect is very much like the sonata form. In Propertius Rome, Caesar was plotting against India and extending the boundaries of empire to their maximum dimensions. The notion that history repeated in this way was um, always of interest to Pound. The notion, too, that you can put a poem together out of all those thousands of Latin words that lie around in the English vocabulary, avoiding the English words, the Anglo-Saxon words, as much as possible, and in that way get a tone of aloof and ironic superciliousness, which was exactly the tone in which to approach the imperial theme in Pan's view. Caesar plots against India. Tigris and Euphrates shall from now on flow at his bidding. 
to bet she'll be full of Roman policemen. The Parthians shall get used to our statuary and acquire a Roman religion. One raft on the veiled flood of Acheron, Marius and Jugurtha together. Nor at my funeral either will there be any long trail bearing ancestral lares and images. No trumpets filled with my emptiness. Nor shall it be on an metallic bed. The perfumed cloths shall be absent. A small plebeian procession. Enough, enough and in plenty. And there will be three books at my obsequies that I take my not unworthy gift to Persephone. You will follow the bear's scarified breast. Nor will you be weary of calling my name, nor too weary to place the last kiss on my lips when the Syrian onyx is broken. He who is now vacant dust was once the slave of one passion. Give that much inscription. Death, why tardily come? They don't get the irony. Propertius is one of the great classical poets to sing of love. The poet writes about love and not about the empire. The Roman poets are the only ones we know of who had exactly the same problems as we have. The metropolis, imperial posts to all corners of the world. Brown's hopes for England did not revive with the armistice. He embarked on a new poem, part farewell to London, part parody of his own career as a poet. For three years, out of key with his time, he strove to resuscitate the dead art of poetry, to maintain the sublime in the old sense. Wrong from the start. No, hardly, but seeing he had been born in a half-savage country out of date, bent resolutely on wringing lilies from the acorn, caponaires, trout for factitious bait. He and Eliot had been reading some of the modern French poets, but particularly Théophile Gautier, uh, and uh, Pound's stanzas are not Gautier's stanzas by any means. They're much less neat. Daring as never before, wastage as never before, young blood and high blood, fair cheeks and fine bodies, fortitude as never before, frankness as never before, disillusions as never told in the old days, hysterias, trench confessions, laughter out of dead bellies. There died a myriad and were the best among them for an old bitch gone in the teeth. For a botched civilization. Pound went to Paris. Interviewed by the New York Herald, he said, I find the decay of the British Empire too depressing a spectacle to witness at close range. Asked about his plans, Mr. Pound said, I am devoting myself to a study of 12th century music. I am also writing a long poem, although I realize one should not write long poems in the 20th century. In Paris, Pound mixed with George Antile, the American composer of Ballet Mécanique, 
Antile was the friend of a young violinist, Olga Rudge. I saw him in the concert hall, but I never actually met him until a couple of weeks later. And uh, I was told, oh, you know, he's a critic. And he'd been to our concert, you understand what I mean. And Ezra was looking extremely amused, as he, could, <laughs> as he might, because he had given us a very bad notice. I've done cantos five, six, and seven, and each is more incomprehensible than the one preceding it. I don't know what's to be done about it. Pound's cantos began as one thing, and very quickly slid into something else. They began as the um, as the translation from the Odyssey that begins the cantos indicates, as that most classical, most perfect of themes, the journey to the dead. And then went down to the ship, set keel to breakers, forth on the godly sea, and we set up mast and sail on that swart ship. Four sheep aboard her, and our bodies also heavy with weeping. And winds from sternward bore us out onward with bellying canvas. Circe is this craft, the trim coiffed goddess. Pan can be simultaneously an American poet, an imitator of the Anglo Saxon seafarer and a translator of the 11th Book of the Odyssey, all at the same time. The fact that these are chronologically enormously distant from one another doesn't disturb them in the least. We appear to have lost the radiant world where one thought cuts through another with a clean edge, a world of moving energies, the Mediterranean sanity that gave the churches like Saint-Hilaire, San Zeno, the Duomo di Modena, the clear lines and proportions. Not the pagan worship of strength, nor the Greek perception, but this harmony of the sentient, where the thought has its demarcation, the substance, its virtu, where stupid men have not reduced all energy to unbounded, undistinguished abstraction. The country of Dante seemed a more secure home for a poet in exile embarked on an epic work. The Pounds moved to Rapallo in 1924, a small town on the northern Italian coast. It was to be their home for the next 20 years. Well, it was a completely different atmosphere from now because it was a time of the English colony. The English people used to spend the winter here, and the rich English people had villas here and came there every winter. There was even a paper once published in English on the Riviera in La Palo. There was an English journalist who came to met a, met a, an inquire about the Italian political opinions. And when he came back, he said, uh, well, there are so many liberals, so many socialists, so many communists, so many democristians. And then they asked, and the fascists? Oh, they are all fascists. Pound thought that he would be able to educate Mussolini the way Confucius tried to educate the Chinese rulers. In fact, he had these Confucian posters set up in Rapallo during the war. If an archer misses the bull's eye, he should look for the cause in himself and uh, to live in such a way that your descendants will be grateful and, and all these, these mottos. Pound not only admired Confucian ethics, he discovered in the East a method for writing his cantos. Well, I get it that I am no calligrapher and I never use a brush. You have primitive sun, then when they want to make it pretty, they square it up. And uh, that's the sun, then for the dawn, you got the sun over the horizon. And you have tree. And to get the east, you have the tree with the sun in its branches, the way you'd see the sun coming up. And later in the day, when the sun is higher, you got him there sitting on the very top of the tree. 
It is that if you set two things side by side, uh, they will produce not only each other, but something else, which is uh, really the reaction of the two together. Thus, you need not have connecting links all the time as you go on in the poetry. Pound promoted his ideas tirelessly, even from his Rapallo outpost. He wrote cantos and edited a literary supplement for Il Mare, the Rapallo newspaper. With Dorothy's help, Ezra started concerts in the town hall to help revitalize local culture. One frequent visitor and constant performer was Olga Rudge. She and Ezra also collaborated to research and rescue the original manuscripts of Vivaldi. In 1924, Ezra and Olga Rudge had a daughter, Mary. She was given into the care of foster parents in the Italian Tyrol for the first 10 years of her life. After a while, I think that he found it an interesting experience to be a parent. Obviously, he knew about Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I didn't, but... Uh, uh, and then there is always the idea of the make it new. Uh, if you want to start civilization, I mean, you, you have to start somewhere. And uh, with me, he certainly had a very, um, well, a clean slate. Well, I came here first in uh, 1934, and uh, it was arranged that I should become a student in uh, what Ezra called the Esuversity. The lectures of the Esuversity always took place at lunch and dinner and he would hold a brilliant uh, monologue, which would go on throughout the meal, uh, ranging on every possible uh, subject. Uh, he always read the Italian papers quite carefully, and very often he would bring the newspaper to the table, and he would go through it, uh, uh, pointing out enormities of what uh, various politicians or various bankers uh, were doing uh, in different countries. His politics uh, came almost entirely out of his interest in monetary reform. And out of this uh, economic obsession, and it was an obsession, uh, came most of his political ideas. Usury is the cancer of the world, which only the surgeon's knife of fascism can cut out of the life of nations. One of the reasons why Jews traditionally and historically were allowed to become bankers and creditors is that the Christian church uh, didn't itself believe in allowing usury, but wanted pagans and malcontents like Jews to practice it, with the result that Jews um, got the reputation for being the only moneylenders in the world. Pietro Lombardo came not by usura, Duccio came not by usura, nor Pier della Francesca, Juan Belin, not by usura, nor was La Calunia painted. Came not by usura, Angelico, came not Ambrogio Predis. No church of cut stone sign the damo may fake it. Not by usura, Saint Trophim, not by usura, Saint Hilaire. Usura rusteth the chisel. It rusteth the craft and the craftsman. It gnaweth the thread in the loom. None learneth to weave gold in her pattern. Azure hath a canker by usura. Karamas is unbridled. Emerald findeth no memling. Usura slayeth the child in the womb. It stayeth the young man's courting. It hath brought palsy to bed, lieth between the young bride and her bridegroom, contra naturam. It became of such extreme importance to him that his ideas should get some uh, circulation uh, that he made the trip back to the United States in 1939 uh, when he failed to see Roosevelt, uh, but he did see a few politicians. I believe that he did get to see uh, Henry Wallace uh, for about 10 minutes, but uh, it was just a nice to meet you, you great man, goodbye. 
he left uh, rather despondent. I mean, he, I think he, he was very hurt that uh, people would not take him seriously as an economic and political thinker. Pound began making radio speeches from Italy before the war on cultural subjects. Now he approached the Italian authorities to make more broadcasts. He wanted to do it, and he wanted to do it as an American citizen, and they gave him the promise that they wouldn't chop or change anything, and they didn't. So that's that. He may have made mistakes, but he took, he took responsibility for them, and, that, uh, and I don't think he did. <laughs> I mean, the way things are going now, I think it's... it's anyway. As I've always made it clear that he was not specifically aiding and giving comfort to Italy, who was at war with America, he was saying what he, what he thought as a free American citizen, which, had he been able to say it on American soil, would not have been treasonable. Ma penso che io una volta a Pound, eh, con uh, timore, gli ho fatto notare se non poteva eh, subire delle conseguenze da questi discorsi. E lui fece così, come una risata, così. Quindi non ho idea. Forse lui era un po' ingenuo in queste cose e pensava che non era un'azione così grave che non era offendere la sua patria, perché lui se la prendeva con un uomo, se la prendeva con Roosevelt. Io penso che fosse così. Poi... Pound's broadcasts are, first of all, unbelievably incoherent. Second, they are fiendishly obscene. Uh, there are attacks there on um, Franklin D. Roosevelt, on Mrs. Roosevelt, on blacks, on Jews. You have not had a will to maintain the Constitution or to maintain on its just government. And now I hear New York meat is slaughtered by Jewish butchers, or was a decade ago. Maybe now there is less of it to slaughter. Maybe all American meat is slaughtered by Jewish butchers. Yes, long pig is what the cannibals call it. Is now, Pound did not himself uh, kill Jews. Pound uh, is notoriously uh, fond of poet disciples like Louis Zukowski and Allen Ginsberg. Um, he has said over and over again something so typically poundish as the fact that no one called Ezra to be an anti-Semite. But these things are all frivolous and insignificant to me, and I do not plan to spend the rest of my life hating Ezra Pound. But the fact is, certain things happen in Europe that cannot be forgotten and should not be forgotten, and only damn fools in the literary camp think that they're not significant. With the escalation of Allied bombings, the Germans in 1943 forced the seafront residents of Rapallo to leave their homes. Ezra and Dorothy moved in with Olga Raj at San Ambrogio. Well, the Ménage à Trois was unavoidable because of the war. There was nothing else they could do. And it was certainly not happy for any of them, as far as I can tell. People don't realize also that, uh, that, that Israel was never so poor in his life. He just made his bare expenses, and he had, uh, and he had three women to support. And Dorothy had nothing, and, uh, and I had nothing. And uh, so that, uh, I mean, it was extremely, extremely uh, tight. The writing of the Peace and Candles started long before Pisa. He had accumulated enough knowledge and enough experience, and then war broke out. But as soon as he moved up to Sant'Ambrogio, I think he started to write cantos. You understand, these partisans that came for, for Ezra, they were common thieves. They were in prison for, for robbing villas. That's what, they were just simply thieves. And so they were, li they were liberated. So they, they, living in the thing, they thought they would get a very fine, uh, a fine uh, reward from the, from the Americans. 
when Ezra was, was put in, uh, into, the, into the camp, he disappeared from the circulation. Nobody knew where he was for months and months and months. Now, if you, if you think that's fair, and he was in Pisa, that is an hour's ride from, from, from Rapallo. Well, the cage had a concrete floor, and I would say it was about uh, maybe six feet tall. It was about uh, four, four or five feet wide. It was reasonably comfortable, but it was exposed to the elements. And of course, at night, he had these strong, glaring Klieg lights, giving the old man, well, he was 60, 61, whatever it was, but it gave him no rest at night. And of course, he had the hot Tuscan sun broiling down on him all day. And between that and the gawking of all the prisoners who passed by, he really was very much like an animal on display. I had no legal right to, to go. The, 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 the laws were that the blood relations were allowed to, well, to visit once a month, I think, for a couple of hours or something like that. So, um, so I, I, got, I applied for Mary. It was really just a, a kind of physical reunion that was important. I mean, not, not much was said and not much was done. I mean, one embraced each other and one wept, and, uh, and that was it. He'd come into the medical headquarters, settle down behind this old typewriter, and start pecking away with two fingers. He had no books. He had nothing, really. He was reduced to Mother Nature. And many times I'd go into his tent and find him lying flat on the grassy floor, studying the grass, studying the bugs. He was a great one to study the moon and the stars, and line them up with his tent pole, or line them up with a whole, the uh, smoke light, the smoke vent up in the uh, ceiling of the tent. So really, it's all the old man had, although he was only 60. I don't know why I call him old. But he seemed to be old. He had that goatee, and he had this walking stick, and he'd get up every morning, and he'd duel out in front of his tent. He'd pretend that he was fencing. He was a great one, you know, for physical exercise. He was always himself. He'd dream up his own weird gymnastics. Very abrupt, very jerky, and always very pointed with that cane or walking stick that he had. There's virtually nothing in the cantos to reflect the fact that the author was being charged with treason. I think if, um, if you didn't know that, you would probably never be able to extract it from the poem. The, con the, the concentration is on the total collapse of the, of the, um, the Mussolini regime and the whole, the whole fascist experiment. The enormous tragedy of the dream and the peasant's bent shoulders. This, this leaves the author with nothing to do but return in memory to London. And the real, the real sight of the Pisa Encanters much of the time is London. The landscape is Italian. But against that Italian landscape, we have, the, uh, we have moving the ghosts of those he knew in London and the world that he left behind him. And, uh, and a certain amount, a certain amount of self-examination about whether that was the most fundamental mistake of his life, whether he should have stayed there. When he, when he regained hope, when he finally had access to the typewriter. And, you know, when we speak of his hope and his optimism and his sort of American dream, I think it flared up tremendously as soon as the Americans arrived in, in Italy. You know, he thought that now he could finally tell them, you know, everything that he knew, that he could finally put his knowledge uh, to the service of his country. And they just pointed a finger at Pound and said, get your gear together, you've got 10 minutes. Get to your tent, we'll wait. They waited outside. Pound threw the book at me. Uh, 
Picked up his papers and ran to his tent. He was back in about 10 minutes with an old army overcoat, old, old scarf, crazy hat, army, little abbreviated army hat. And he came up to me and warmly shook hands and he said, Grusin, this is it. And he took his right hand, put it up around his neck and went like this. That trip, I think, was cruelty. But he never looked upon it that way. I mean, first of all, they take him, you know, sort of out of the blue, drive all night to Rome. And yet, when he was up in the air, at one point, he was together in, a, in an ordinary plane with other people. He started to pace the aisle and sing. And some person, whose name I have fortunately forgotten, has written a little piece of saying, well, this is obviously a sign of madness. And when I read that, I got so angry because this was the first time that Pound was up in the air. Legally, it was uh, very serious because uh, he was indicted for treason, which I believe is a capital offense for having made these broadcasts. And the uh, government had uh, imported all these uh, plane load of uh, uh, witnesses from the Italian uh, radio building to, who would point the finger and say, yes, this is the man who made such and such a broadcast. But the complete the press climate, the public climate, was absolutely uh, down on Ezra. I mean, uh, you know, for one person who thought he was a great poet, there were 100,000 who thought he was a son of a bitch. The consensus was unanimous that uh, one must try for the unsound mind uh, route. That uh, he, uh, first of all, he was mentally unable to defend himself, and secondly, what defense did he have technically? I mean, he, the defense he was going to plead, he told me afterwards, was that he'd only been uh, defending the Constitution and expressing his rights as a citizen. But you see, the way the law is worded, it takes really no account of what is in the broadcast. It takes account of where the broadcast was made, under the auspices of what government, under what auspices. That's the thing uh, which a good uh, prosecuting attorney would hammer at and, and get the jury on. At that stage, I think he had given up hope for America. Because, I mean, this, this hope for America, this creating of a paradise fit for humanity to live in, he had by that time given up. Pound was to spend the next 13 years at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. First, at Howard's Hall. He was pretty quickly moved from there to uh, Chestnut Ward, which was the ward for the senile people. It was no pink parlor, but uh, it was uh, a little bit lighter and brighter. And uh, there he was able to have his own uh, little cubicle where he could, he had a desk and his typewriter and a bunk. He had his books in orange boxes, you know. The thing about the candles is that it does reflect the mind in great trouble. And I don't call that great trouble poetry. I call it great trouble. So that with all the beautiful things in the canvas, there are many beautiful lines. They are only beautiful lines. They are only wonderful fragments. They are only, how should I put it, hopes rather than deeds. The page of Simner in Rockville, in Thrones, and in Drops and Fragments, as good as anything he ever did in his entire life, there's no doubt of that. There are four successive cantos in Rockville which sustain the visionary mode more continuously than he ever sustained it before or since. When he comes into the poem convincingly, it is always in a role of someone remote in space and remote in time.
The movement to get Pound out of St. Elizabeth's was led by Archibald MacLeish, T.S. Eliot, and other writers. In 1958, they succeeded. The news that he was released, I heard on the radio. Oh, I'm sort of sheer chance that I just heard it, and I couldn't believe it. And when he came, it was just unbelievably wonderful, because it was so much better than, than any expectations. And then one realized, you know, when the euphoria boiled down, one realized, of course, that he had missed out on, on 20 years' life. And it, you just can't recapture. From drafts made in St. Elizabeth's, Pound put together 14 cantos for publication. He became restless. After six months at Brunnenberg Castle, he wanted to resume the world he had once known. When he got out of St. Elizabeth, they should have given Ezra a very thorough checkup. Physically, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't up to all uh, that thing. You see, he got ill there. He never became again what he was before. I don't know if it was connected with his illness and so, but he, he was another person then. Maybe it was a drop which filled the glass, you know. There's always a certain age where we change our personality. Everybody, also the most normal people. He was already, already an extravagant nature and character, like all artists are. And maybe the illness was the last drop of which made him become old. The word went out that Pound was no longer speaking, that he had entered a deliberate silence. Part of the risk he is taking is um, that of Conducting his life with sufficient scale and dignity to be an appropriate central figure for this poem. Because he is not only the author of it, he is in many ways its central figure. It's, uh, it's Odysseus, it's Confucius, it's, um, its rulers, its economists are projections of him. This is a role he has, to, he has to take the risk of being able to sustain right to the end, wherever the end may be. What the poem does manage to produce by way of an ending is the fragmentary consciousness of a very old man. What thou lovest well remains, the rest is dross. What thou lovest well shall not be reft from thee. What thou lovest well is thy true heritage whose world, or mine, or theirs, or is it of none? First came the scene, then thus the palpable Elysium, though it were in the halls of hell. What thou lovest well is thy true heritage. What thou lovest well shall not be reft from thee. And the answer sent her in his dragon world, pull down thy vanity, it is not man made courage or made order or made grace. Pull down thy vanity, I say, pull down. Learn of the green world what should be thy place in scaled invention or true artistry. Pull down thy vanity. Back and pull down the green cask has outdone your arrogance. Master thyself, then others shall thee bear. Pull down thy vanity. Thou art a beaten dog beneath the hail, a swollen magpie and a fitful sun, half black, half white, nor knowst thou wing from tail. Pull down thy vanity. How mean thy hates fostered in falsity. Pull down thy vanity, wraith to destroy, niggard in charity. Pull down thy vanity, I say, pull down. 
but to have done instead of not doing, this is not vanity. To have with decency knocked that a blunt should open, to have gathered from the air of live tradition, or from a fine old eye the unconquered flame, this is not vanity. Here error is all not done, all in the diffidence that faltered. Major funding for the Voices and Visions series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Annenberg Media. Additional series funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. Special funding is provided by the Witter Binner Foundation for Poetry. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, Call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.